better run, man. Life's a pain, but you got me. Yeah, life's a pain, but I got you. Hey, what's up, Parasites? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And this week, we're going to spend a couple episodes going through the latest Venom run from Al Ewing and Torin Gronbeck, who uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing her name right, who came in and did some fill-in writing on the issues that we're going to talk about today, where she sets up a new symbiote uh, bonding to Black Widow and then tells a story that deals with Bren, who is the new toxin, and Dylan and Sleeper and Flash and kind of Dylan building his army, getting ready for the big battle that is for sure to come in the uh, coming months, if not by the end of the year, for Venom and Venom Comics. So we're going to talk about these issues today. We got issues 23, 26, 27, and 28. And I know you're thinking, hey, wait, why are you going out of order? Well, we're just going to try to do this in a linear fashion. So in the next episode, we're going to talk about issue 29, which just recently released. And then we're going to talk about issues 24 and 25, because technically that's what happens in, t in chronological order. That's kind of where it, where it ends up. So you need 29 first to kind of help set up something that happens in 25. <laughs> Even though 25 takes place before 29, it does end after 29. So yeah, you know, when you're dealing with time travel and, you know, all that kind of stuff, you're bound to have issues like this. So we're going to try to do our best. And today, like I said, we're just going to briefly talk about these four issues. And each time I talk about an issue, a digital code is going to go up. So let's start with number 23. Boom. There's the digital code for issue 23. First person to put that code in gets a copy of this comic book. So go to that website, put that code in, and it only works once. So if you want all these issues, you're just going to have to pay attention to the episode and see where they drop and then go put those codes in. But if you just want one and you want to save some for other people, just comment down below what issue you got so people know which ones are still available. So without further ado, let's dive into Torin's first issue here. This is her, before she started on the Carnage book, she got some writing here on the Venom books. And she tells this one-shot story called Sins of the Father, which does also set up these three issues. So that's why we're doing them all together. And I don't want to go through every single beat. You know, I think these are pretty good issues. I had a couple criticisms, but then by the end of the run, I was like, well, actually that answers some of my questions I had. So it kind of smoothed out. And I ended up liking this a little bit because it deals with characters like Toxin, who I was curious about. I thought, hey, that was a new cool take on Toxin where you make it a little kid and his father is working for Alchemex and is one of the new guardsmen slash jury characters. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's a cool little twist. And they didn't really do much with it for a while now. So this run kind of deals with those characters and changes up things with Toxin, which is kind of cool because he's unique. You know, he's the, the grandson of Venom, the son of Carnage. He's the 1,000th symbiote, you know, in the timeline or whatever it is in their bloodline. So he's got a special ability and, and a, a few special abilities that are unique to him. And then he goes through a change or the suit goes through a change and does Bren in this run. So first up, Sins of the Father. We have art here by Ken Lashley and Raymond Box, who is they both do a great job on this issue. And it starts off with a fight. And at first, this was my criticism. I'm like, why are they fighting? Because Toxin shows up, starts fighting Venom, and then Venom grabs him. And Toxin goes, wait, wait, I just want to talk. I just want to talk. And I hate when they do that, when you know they just throw in fights just to get a little spectacle in there. I know it's comics and you need a spectacle, but come up with a reason for them to fight. So my first criticism was like, well, this feels really random. I wish they didn't do that. But then immediately after on the next page, they actually explain why Bren, Toxin here, attacked Venom. And it's because this takes place a few weeks prior to the, you know, the main story starting in this issue. And you find out that Alchemex is being blackmailed right now. Uh, it looks like they may have poisoned a water reserve in this small town in like Middle America, which reminds me a lot of Resident Evil. And, uh, and it's funny because that'll tie in later because of my, you know, how I always compare them to Life Foundation. So, you know, Alchemex is being blamed or, or it seems like they're being blamed for this event that happened where uh, something got leaked into the water. It went into a small town and made a bunch of people sick. And a lot of people died, lost their family, lost their loved ones. And so a new terrorist group was created called No One. And in this, we had Brent going to Dylan and attacking him and saying, like, look, I found a file that my dad has on you. Apparently they're hunting Venom because they believe Venom is the one who is behind this. They believe that Venom is No One and is uh, trying to expose Alchemex. And Dylan's like, look, it's not me. So that's the reason there was a fight. I'm like, okay, that makes sense now. Uh, so they decide to partner up. And Dylan says, look, there's a battle coming, most likely. My father, Eddie, is lost in time, and he's slowly becoming this villain known as Meridius. Or, you know, he's changing, and, you know, he was Bedlam, and that's the last I saw of him. So he could come back and be a threat, and I'm going to need help taking him down so we can save him. 
So I'll tell you what, Bren, I'll help you with this mission if you help me save my father when the time comes. So they, you know, agree and they make a pact to work together. And then we flash forward now to present day when the story is actually taking place. And you see that the, the you know, the events of Alchemix have ramped up. This group, no one is really sticking it to them. And they're going so far as to getting victims and tying them to these chairs and infecting them with this chemical. And it's slowly draining and killing, you know, the inside of these people and hollowing them out. And it's really nasty and, and bloody. And they're videotaping it and putting it on the news and demanding that the people or the corporation that's behind these attacks, if you come out and tell the truth, this person will live. We'll cure them and they'll live. And Alchemex is not stepping up. And people don't know in the public right now that it is Alchemex that is supposed to step up because they're the ones being blackmailed with this. So Alchemex knows, and they're not really doing much to stop or save these people that are being broadcast, their deaths are being broadcast on TV. So it kind of doesn't paint Alchemex in a good light or Liz. And they, I think, conveniently remove Liz from this because I feel like if they actually had Liz in this story, you would see that she cares. You know, she wouldn't want, you know, her employees being killed like this. So I wish they had Normie and, you know, Liz as a part of this story, especially since it's, you know, Dylan building a symbiote army. It would be neat to include them, and I'm sure they will include them at some point down the road, but it would have been neat to see Liz in this story. That's like my one major critique of it. But, you know, page count wise, I can see that they had to cram a lot in. If they got one extra issue, I could see maybe them doing something like that, uh, you know, Torin doing that. But for me, I just would have liked that in there because it deals with Alchemex. So to me, it should have Liz Allen involved, um, but it doesn't. And that's OK. So what happens, though, is we do have a mysterious woman who is going around trying to piece this story together. And you find out that that mystery woman is actually Black Widow. And Natasha is on the case of who no one is. And it turns out it's an old acquaintance of hers uh, named Keith. And he is in charge or one of the main people of no one. And so as she confronts him, he tries to betray her. And she reveals something major, a change to her. But before we get there, I just want to go over the last of this issue here, this issue 23, where you find out, you know, Dylan and... Uh, and Bran are teaming up and they go in to try to save these people who have been kidnapped by no one. And you think no one is one guy at first. And you're like, okay, it's just like some guy who lost his kid and you, you kind of empathize a little bit, but he's kidnapping people and killing them. So obviously he's taking things too far and he's punishing the wrong people in a way uh, for you know the sins of a corporation. And so he's kind of obviously lost it and, and gone too far. And they go to fight him and he puts up a big fight and ends up dropping a grenade and killing himself and in that battle though venom and bran or toxin they see a bunch of kids and other people innocent victims that were going to be put on the list of being killed and broadcast and they see them and they're able to save them in time before the building explodes so you do get some super heroics in here which is really cool from dylan and uh, bran here who both run out with these children and these people and save them so yeah really cool i mean i thought this was a neat issue and it, like i said it was cool to see bran again and even though i'm getting kind of tired of you know, every symbiote, major symbiote character seems to have a kid attached to them. Like Misery, obviously, is an exception, and Flash Thompson is an exception. But Venom, Red Goblin, and Toxin are all kids right now. So um, I'm waiting for that other shoe to drop and for, like, Kid Carnage to show up. But I guess that's what Red Goblin is. But we also found out in, a, in an issue that we're going to talk about coming up that uh, Rascal is a little bit more connected to Bedlam. Uh, but is also connected to Carnage still. So that original story that where they kind of set up where you know, where Rascal came from is still there, but they added another wrinkle to it, and we'll get to that very soon in the upcoming Venom issue. So at the end, you know, no one is dead. His grenade went off, but another person in the same costume as no one, it's like a gas mask and soldier outfit, he comes online and says, all right, well, you killed one of us, but we are no one, and we are many, and we have another set of victims, and we're going to, you know, slowly kill this person until this company that we want comes out and tells the truth. So the issue does end with them saving some people, but the overall threat is not resolved. And that's where these three issues come in. So real briefly to go over these, you have Natasha, like I said, meeting with Keith. And the story is called State of Grace, and there's actually a meaning for that, which happens later, so I'll get to that. Um, but like I said, Natasha reveals a very new secret of hers. At the end of issue 23, when she shows up at the building that exploded where Dylan and you know Toxin saved those people, there was a symbiote in there. And that symbiote now bonds with Natasha and the two of them are working together to crack the case of who no one is and to try to save 
you know, Alchemex, uh, you know, since they're possibly being wrongly accused of what's actually happening. And Natasha knows more because she's a government agent. She's been a spy. She's worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. So she has access to more information. So she's getting to the bottom of things and she's using her new symbiote friend to do so, who kills Keith, an acquaintance of Natasha's for the past like 10 or so years. And she kill you know, the suit kills that character. And she even says, you know, you don't have to kill. And the suit's like, yeah, well, I'm still learning. And she's like, that's okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm learning too. I've, I've never seen the appeal of symbiotes before. But now that, uh, you know, we're bonded and you, we can share these things, I'm starting to see like the tactical advantage of this. So Natasha's looking at this from a completely different standpoint. And it's kind of exposing new stories to tell with Natasha, which I'm for to an extent. You get to see a different side of her where she's a little bit more trusting. But then again, we've seen that side of her. Like she was maybe less trusting in the beginning, but for the past like 15, 20 years in comics, she's made friends, a lot more friends. And she's very more, you know, very trusting with her friends. So this to me feels like, oh, you're not really doing much new with Natasha. And that's why I'm kind of anti her getting a symbiote. Um, but she has one and they do one of my favorite things that the symbiotes do, which is they transfer memories. So Keith's memories now go into Natasha's you know, mind and she's navigating them to see what she can learn about no one. And what's cool is there's a whole page where the you know Torin explains that the symbiote is explaining to Natasha how this works, how she can decipher her memories from Keith's memories so they don't combine together and how she can watch things like a movie and learn the details she needs to learn and rewind and look at things and zoom in. Like, so the suit is helping her uh, use this information. And I was like, okay, that's cool because I've always loved the memory transfer that symbiotes are able to do. And this brings it to a different level and exposes some more things or reveals some more things. And then you see someone using it for the first time and using it like a spy would, which is like, all right, let's see the evidence. And she pulls up these memories and she's, you know, looking at them and stuff and studying them like photographs in an interrogation. And I'm like, that's cool. I really, I dig that a lot. So I thought Torian really killed it there. And the artwork on this book, you'll notice is different. It's because Julius Otto is the artist on this issue. So the art does change up, but I like it. They're very clean lines. Um, and Julius does a really good job drawing symbiotes too. I really like how they draw Toxin because Toxin kind of has like that, you know, blade two thing where their mouth kind of opens up and this like sliver comes out and stuff. So it's, it's really cool. I, I dig it. So, um, now they're all in the hive, you know, Venom is being attacked. Alchemex is, you know, still thinking that he's involved somehow. So they swarm Dylan's apartment. They found out that, you know, Venom is Dylan currently and that he's tied to Eddie Brock. He's Eddie Brock's son. So they all swarm Dylan's place, but he ends up, you know, fleeing. And while he's fleeing, he goes into the hive mind and talks to Toxin and also Widow, who shows up in her symbiote costume for the first time. And the three of them are talking and working on a plan. And Dylan's like, yeah, you know what? I, I want to help Bren. You know, I made a deal with him. He's going to help me with my father. So I want to help him save his dad, who's in the thick of this with Alchemex. And we want to save these innocent people. So Dylan's all on board teaming up with these two, but he is a little cautious of Widow, which I like because he's like, look, I don't know where this symbiote came from. She doesn't know where the symbiote came from. It, it says it's like a baby and it's like new and, you know, so it could be an offspring of toxin or something that happened in the building before the explosion. We don't really know where the symbiote came from yet. And I'm sure that will be revealed in time. But for now, Venom's a little weary of it, and he's kind of curious and and not trusting of this new symbiote. And he also doesn't know who Black Widow is. They never worked together really before. So that's another element where he's like, all right, I got to warm up to this person. But she seems to want to help. And so for that reason, I'll, I'll stick by her side, but I'm still going to keep her in my perif. So, uh, yeah, I get to see a little bit of a, a non-trusting side of Dylan, which makes sense. You know, he's didn't have the best childhood, um, so... I'm around adults, I'm sure he's kind of like weary. That's why he's befriended all these other symbiote kids so easily. But uh, with adults, he's very standoffish. And so I like that. It's very true to his character. So now Black Widow is able to use the symbiote and look like Keith and go in and get some more information on no one. And while she does that, she's transferring that information to Dylan through the hive and they're using the hive to communicate, which I really like as someone who's going through something with of an internal headspace with our system and, and our diagnosis. I'm appreciating this a little bit more of how they go into the hive and communicate with each other. It, it, it has a different meaning to me personally now um, that probably wasn't intended when they were writing this, but it, it very much feels like a DID or OSDD system 
the way the symbiotes communicate with each other in the hive space. And then also with, you know, Eddie in the garden uh, of time. So we'll get into that in those issues. But uh, but for here, you know, this is the big setup. And Bran at the end of this issue gets kidnapped. He gets taken down by soldiers that show up and you're like, OK, so the no one soldiers have weapons that are laced with something that burn the symbiote and they're able to hurt the symbiote and separate it from Bren and take Bren and kidnap him. And they want to use him because his dad is a member of Alchemex and, you know, works for, for them and is one of the guardsmen. So they're like, okay, well, if we have this kid now, we'll make him the next victim. We'll put him on the TV and, you know, we'll see how the world reacts to a kid being killed slowly. And this, you know, corporation that we're trying to blackmail, if they don't come out, then people are really going to, you know, rev up and be like, okay, now you're killing kids. But it seems like such a weird way to like get your message across. And that makes sense because they're villains. So of course it's a warped sense of justice they're after. There are people that were wronged and that sucks. And, and it's awful that, you know, you can empathize with that. But the level they're going to and kidnapping innocent people and torturing them and injecting them with the same chemical that killed their families may seem like poetic justice to them, but they have definitely gone way too far in their, their want for vengeance or, you know, or, or payback. And, uh, and it's, it gets really bad. And so now Bran is the next one on the chopping block who could die from this. And he's being broadcast on TV. So the clock is ticking. And Venom and Toxin, which is just the symbiote separated from Bran, obviously, because it was separated in that battle. The, the Toxin symbiote sunk into the sewers and Venom found it along with Widow. And they gave it a new host, which they, they bonded it to someone who works for uh, no one. But before they did that, they did this really cool thing where Venom, which I thought was very alien and cool, where, and Torin, if this was her idea, this was a really good idea, where they take the symbiote, like Venom sees the, the remains of the, the toxin symbiote, picks up a sliver of it and eats it. And then the sliver comes out bonded to Venom's tongue and talks to Venom, which I was like, oh, that's really creepy and cool. <laughs> Actually, I thought that was really neat. And so they communicate and that's when, you know, the suit says, look, they took Bren, clock is ticking. We got to find Bren before he gets injected with stuff and before he dies. And so now that's what their plan is. So that's where 27 and 28, I'll kind of combine these real quick because I don't want to go too long and I don't want to go into too many details, but Bren's father, Oscar, he teams up with Venom. He teams up with Black Widow reluctantly and decides to help them find Bren. And along the way, they also find Sleeper and they recruit him into the mix and they all go in to take down no one and they find out that there's more to it. There's a bigger reveal. It wasn't actually just Alchemex that was responsible for this chemical leak they actually stood up to try to get it to not happen. Like they were like, hey, look, we don't know this chemical. It's not from Earth. Uh, so that's a big clue there of what might happen in future comics with Venom. Um, and that's also the chemical that was in the water is the same thing laced on the weapons that were being used against Toxin and Venom that burned through the symbiotes. So again, a lot of reveals at the end of this, which I really like, but bringing it back to Resident Evil, this small Midwestern town got infected through the water system, much like in Resident Evil. And uh, and it was, I always make the comparison that Life Foundation is like the Marvel Universe version of Umbrella Corporation from Resident Evil. And it turns out that's the case. Through different subsidiaries that Life Foundation owns, turns out they're the ones responsible for the chemical leak in this small town. And even though, you know, they found out when they found out the chemical was toxic, you know, Carlton Drake and other people, they did stand up against this to an extent, but then they saw an opportunity to see what would happen and they they let the chemical outbreak happen and kill people. So it's really Carlton Drake and the Life Foundation who has to be exposed here. And obviously that character has been resurrected by Meridius and is, a, is part of the Alchemex storyline that we talked about recently with Misery and stuff. So I'm really curious how they're going to play that out. I mean, clearly there's a plan here for Life Foundation and I want to see where that goes. I'm actually really interested in that because as a Resident Evil fan, like I said, I compared them to the Umbrella Corporation and this proves it even more. They literally did what Umbrella did. <laughs> they infected a small Midwestern town through the water system uh, with a virus or, you know, something. But in Resident Evil, it's obviously a chemical thing. And in this, it's something from outer space that actually can hurt symbiotes and probably something that Meridius brought to the table because he's secretly working with Carlton Drake. So, yeah, I'm I'm curious where this is all going to go. Um, in the end, you know, they do save Bren, but something happens to him. He has been infected by the chemical. So when the suit, toxin suit, leaves the soldier and rebonds with him, it does hurt the symbiote and it renders it silent. So now Bren is healed, but he can't hear toxin anymore. And like I said, the book is called State of Grace. And the reason for that is because you find out that the main villain or one of the main members of No One, his daughter who he lost, her name was Grace. 
And so that's kind of how that all ties in. Because at first I was like, oh, what an interesting title for this three-part story. And then when you get to that part at the end, I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. Like how he reveals that and says like, yeah, this is all for her. So it's kind of named after this you know, child who was uh, killed during these events with the, the water and, the, you know, and everything like that, the, the chemical in the water. And it's all ties in that way. So I was like, oh, okay. So that's a kind of a neat title that, you know, Torin put in there. Um, I don't know if that was her or editorial or whoever came up with that idea, but whoever did, I liked it. I don't know if it's a combination of both or all of them or whoever. Um, yeah, I was like, oh, cool. They, that t When he said her name, like, yeah, my daughter's name was Grace and she's the one who passed. But, and that made me a nobody because, uh, you know, I'm just a number to these corporations, you know, everyone we work for, everything. We're just a number to them. We're a, a, a lawsuit number. We're just, you know, that's all we are. We're nobody. We don't have a name. We don't have an identity. They'll replace us. They don't care. And he just takes that concept, you know, very far in this with his belief system and how he gets his revenge. So when he, you know, claims his victims, he calls them no ones too. And he's like, look, you're just no one. You're, you know, you're no name. You're nobody. You're just like us. And that I think probably makes him feel better about sacrificing them because he's just like, yeah, you're no one. And all we're going to do is once you're gone, someone's going to feel this sadness and then they're going to just join our cause probably. And uh, it's really warped. And unfortunately, they, that's how they do get some of their recruits. But yeah, I just thought it was really warped. And I just think that's neat how that title kind of wraps this whole story up, like Sins of the Father, that issue 23, that title mattered to that issue because that's what it was about. You know, Bren's father and everything like that and Alchemex and everything. Um, but then that also ties into the no one element because that no one, he was a father. And so that that theme worked really there. So State of Grace also works and how it ties into Bren's story and this young lady, Grace, who died and how her father is now knowing that the, go the government and Life Foundation, they're going to come clean up their mess. So he knew this was all going to blow up in their faces. And that reveal was pretty shocking. Even to me, I was reading, I was like, wow, this guy knew. He knew this was all going to end badly for everybody, but he still wanted, he was hoping that not before the truth came out. And the truth does come out. So in the end, he kind of gets what he wants, um, even though he dies in the end. So Venom and uh, Sleeper decide, okay, let's bring the, you know, Bren and Toxin now to Flash Thompson, and he can use his symbiote abilities to heal Bren. So that's where the book ends. We don't know really know what happens to Widow after this. Um, I know she's going to have her own series with Hawkeye coming up, so you can probably learn more there about what her costume is and you know maybe where it comes from and and all that. So if there's some cool information in that miniseries, we'll definitely cover it on the show as you know we cover symbiote things. But we'll wait till the trade comes out and see what happens. Um, but yeah, so we don't really know what happens with her at the moment, and we also know the truth does come out. You know, uh, Bren's dad, Oscar, he does decide to release the information publicly so that no more people will die, including his son. So he actually gets the truth out there. And I guess I don't know if that means the truth, you know, exposing Alchemex, because obviously that's a problem for Liz Allen that they're going to have to deal with. Um, or if it actually exposes the government working with the Life Foundation, which is the truth. So um, I'm really curious. They say the truth gets out there, but I'm like, OK, well, what does that mean? And does that mean people aren't going to, you know, look at the Life Foundation the same anymore. Uh, technically, they're just now re, you know, rebuilding after Carlton Drake's resurrection. So they're just now coming back as a company. So is this going to affect them? Are they going to really become the Umbrella Corporation where everyone turns on them and their stock prices go down like in Resident Evil 4? Um, you know, I don't know. We'll see. But I, I was curious at the end when they said the truth got out there. And I'm like, OK, so what does that mean? But obviously, this is not a, a story that's over. So maybe we'll learn more of that either in the Carnage book by Torin, um, or maybe we'll learn it more in the Venom series if she comes back and writes some of these Dylan Brock stories. So time will tell. But for now, I just wanted to hear your thoughts. You know, these are mine, and this is just kind of like I gave an overview and gave you some of my thoughts on each of those moments in the story. I ultimately kind of like this. Uh, I like the street level stuff. That's how, you know, that's how I prefer my Venom stories. And I'm not anti-cosmic. And trust me, the next episode, we're going to talk about some major cosmic stuff as, as well as the episode after that. But um, but for this, to have like these little street level stories in in between the big Eddie Brock space time travel stuff is nice. And I got to say on the credit to the editors like, you know, Devin Lewis and everyone who's working on these books. I do like that. I'd like that there's a balance. I understand like it's probably hard to follow the Donny Cates run. And so you kind of want to figure where do we go from here? Well, okay, we want to go more cosmic because now Eddie's the king in black. Okay, but we still need a street level element to this book. And for me, since the beginning, um, it has been the Dylan stuff I've liked the most. The Eddie stuff, the recent things have kind of turned me in, and I've kind of liked a little bit more of the recent stuff, especially with Cafu's artwork. 
But for um, the street level stuff, I've always liked it since the book has started. And that's been the stuff that's pulled me in. And it's cool to see it continue here under a new writer who's just kind of jumping in with both feet and I think doing a really good job. And with the artwork from Ken Lashley, uh, Raymond Box, uh, Julius Otto, and Raphael P uh, Pimentel, uh, awesome stuff. Like the artwork's really great. I really like Raphael's art on the last two issues because the last two issues had like really cool symbiote moments and battles and Venom looks really killer in some of these shots. So yeah, really dig this. I mean, this was this was a fun little street level story with Venom and we need those. And it was so cool to see Sleeper again. Out of all the newer symbiotes, Sleeper is definitely my favorite, the most unique, I feel. And I want to see more stuff with Sleeper. And it sounds like we're going to get it because a war is coming for sure, a symbiote war. And we're going to learn more about that in the next issue that we talk about, the next episode, and then the one after as we go through issue 29 of Venom and also issues 24 and 25. So make sure you stay subscribed so you don't miss out on those episodes because I want to hear your thoughts in those comments. Just like I want to hear your thoughts on this down in the comment section below and we'll keep talking down there. So all those little spoilers and other things that I missed out on or skipped over on purpose, we can keep talking about those details down in the comments. Uh, so yeah, let me know your thoughts down there. And then let me know if you want any of the digital codes. We put up four in this episode. So that was quite a, a handful. And I think we have one or two that might go up in the next episode. But then, uh, or, or actually no, in the third episode, uh, issues 24 and 25, I think those have digital codes. The next episode, there is no digital code. It's issue 29 and there was no uh, free digital code in there. There was, I tried to email, but it's not here in time and I got to record that episode. So uh, I'll get that episode out to you guys immediately. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you all in the future. Peace.